Imagine standing on a windswept cliff 100,000 years ago, the air thick with the scent of pine and salt. Below, a vast plain stretches toward the horizon, dotted with woolly mammoths and grazing deer. In a nearby cave, a group of Neanderthals huddles around a crackling fire, their shadows dancing on the walls. They're crafting tools, stringing shells into necklaces, and sharing stories in a language we can only guess at. These aren't the brutish cavemen of old cartoons. They're our ancestors, part of our story, woven into our very DNA. Today, we're diving into the world of Neanderthals, a journey through prehistoric caves and cutting-edge science to uncover who they were, how they lived, and why their legacy still shapes us. Stick with me because this tale of survival, ingenuity, and connection will change how you see humanity's past. Let's set the scene. It's the Pleistocene, a world of ice and fire. Glaciers carve the landscape, and Europe and Asia are a patchwork of forests, grasslands, and tundra. Neanderthals, stocky and resilient, roam this harsh world. Their home? Caves like those at Mount Carmel in what's now Israel, where limestone cliffs cradle secrets of human evolution. Picture Taban Cave, its entrance framed by rugged stone, where a Neanderthal skeleton from 400,000 years ago was found, perfectly preserved. Nearby, School Cave holds the bones of early modern humans, dating back 100,000 to 120,000 years. These caves weren't just shelters. They were hubs of life, where fires burned, tools were shaped, and communities thrived. Why does this matter? Because Mount Carmel is a crossroads of human history. Here, Neanderthals and modern humans crossed paths, maybe even shared moments by the firelight. This wasn't a clash of titans, but a meeting of kin, two groups more alike than different. My take? These encounters were the spark of something profound, interbreeding that left a mark in our genes. It's like discovering your family tree has a branch you never knew about, one that stretches back to a time when survival meant ingenuity. For too long, Neanderthals were painted as dim-witted brutes, hunched over and grunting. But let's rewrite that script. Picture a Neanderthal hunter, wiry and tough, standing about five, six inches, with powerful bones built for a rugged life. Their skeletons, like the one from Taboon, show signs of osteoarthritis, evidence of a hard existence chasing bison or hauling wood. But they weren't just brawn. Their brains were as large as ours, and their vocal tracks, with hyoid bones like those found in Spain's Atapuerca site, suggest they could speak, maybe even sing or tell tales under the stars. Archaeology backs this up. In caves across Europe and Asia, we find their artistry. Red ochre smeared on scallop shells in Spain, black manganese dioxide used to paint hides, even eagle feathers carefully stripped for decoration. These weren't random acts. They were deliberate, symbolic, human. At a site in Croatia, a microscope revealed twisted plant fibers, proof Neanderthals made string, string. Imagine them weaving nets to catch fish or tying tools to handles. This wasn't a crude existence. It was a culture of creativity. My analysis? We've underestimated Neanderthals because their story was told through bones and stones. But when you zoom in, literally with microscopes, you see a people who planned created, and cared. They weren't lesser than us. They were us, just adapted to a colder, tougher world. It's like comparing a modern city dweller to a mountain guide. Different skills, same humanity. Now let's talk DNA. Fast forward to today, where geneticists at places like the Max Planck Institute have sequenced entire Neanderthal genomes from fragments as small as a shin bone shard from Vindia Cave. Here's the kicker. If you're not from Sub-Saharan Africa, about 3% of your DNA comes from Neanderthals. 
That's like having a great grandparent from a different species whispering through your genes. For six billion people worldwide, that's 200 million Neanderthal equivalents walking among us, more successful now than they ever were. How did this happen? Picture small bands of modern humans leaving Africa, meeting Neanderthals in places like Mount Carmel. Maybe it was a trade of goods, a shared meal, or something more intimate. The result? Hybrids, carrying traits like a bridged mandibular nerve, a dental quirk, that lingered in early European populations. My insight here is that this wasn't a one-off event. It was a slow, messy blending of lives, like cultures mixing in a prehistoric melting pot. The 3% figure comes from comparing non-African genomes to African ones, which have less Neanderthal DNA, showing a clear pattern of interbreeding outside Africa. But what does this 3% do? Some genes, like those for red hair or immune responses, trace back to Neanderthals. Others, like a sugar transporter gene, SLC2A1, might have fueled their big brains, just like ours. The catch? We're still decoding what these genes mean. It's like having a prehistoric recipe book, but not knowing all the ingredients. My take, every new genetic discovery is a window into their world, showing us how closely linked we are. Let's travel to Gibraltar, 30,000 years ago. The rock looms over a coastal plain, now submerged, where Neanderthals lived in sea caves like Gorham's. These were their last strongholds, the edge of their world as modern humans spread. Picture a small group, maybe 20 strong, huddled in a cave, their napping flint tools, cooking cattails in leaf packets, and stringing shells for necklaces. Outside, the world is changing. Modern humans are moving in, their numbers growing. Why did Neanderthals vanish? Some say disease, others competition or climate shifts. My analysis leans toward marginalization. As modern humans expanded, Neanderthals were pushed to the fringes, their populations shrinking. Gorham's cave holds the youngest Neanderthal evidence, a final chapter in their story. It's haunting to think of them there, holding on as the world moved forward. Yet, their genes lived on, carried by hybrids into the future. To make this real, let's imagine a Neanderthal named Kale. Not a hero, just one of many. Kale lived in a cave in what's now Croatia, part of the Krapina site where dozens of Neanderthal bones were found. At 30, he's old for his time, his joints aching from years of hunting. One winter, his arm is crushed by a falling rock. His group doesn't abandon him. They wrap his arm in hides, share their meat, and keep him by the fire. Why? Because Kale knows the best hunting trails, the signs of a coming storm. This care, seen in skeletons with healed injuries, shows Neanderthals valued their own, just as we do. Or consider a modern parallel. In 2018, archaeologists in Iraq reopened Shanidar Cave, where a Neanderthal with an amputated arm was found. Imagine a woman, let's call her Lyra, who lost her arm to a predator attack. Her group adapted, crafting tools she could use one-handed, much like how modern communities support veterans with prosthetics. These stories bridge the gap. Neanderthals weren't so different from us in their compassion. Step back into the Pleistocene, a world sculpted by ice and time, where the air carries the chill of glaciers and the distant roars of saber-toothed cats. Neanderthals didn't just survive this unforgiving landscape, they mastered it. Their lives unfolded across a vast stage, from the windswept cliffs of Gibraltar to the rugged Altai Mountains in Central Asia. Picture a Neanderthal band in a Croatian valley, their cave nestled in a limestone karst much like the rolling hills of modern-day Wisconsin's Driftless area. They're surrounded by pine forests and open plains where herds of red deer and bison roam. The ground crunches underfoot with frost, and the sky is a deep, endless blue. This was their world, and it was as dynamic as it was harsh. 
Archaeological sites tell us how they thrived. At Blombos Cave in South Africa, 100,000 years ago, early modern humans were carving ochre into intricate patterns and mixing pigments in abalone shells, creating what might have been the first art studios. Meanwhile, in Europe, Neanderthals were doing something strikingly similar. In Spain's Cueva de los Aviones, they painted scallop shells with red ochre, mirroring the natural bands on the shell's other side. This wasn't just decoration. It was a statement, a way of saying, this is who we are. My take? This parallel creativity suggests a shared human spark flickering in different corners of the world. Neanderthals and early modern humans weren't so different. They were experimenting, innovating, and leaving their mark. Consider their ingenuity with plants. At sites like Kibara Cave in Mount Carmel, microscopic starch granules in Neanderthal dental calculus reveal they ate cattails, oats, and wild grains. They didn't have pots, so how did they cook? Imagine them wrapping grains in broad leaves or stuffing them into animal stomachs, steaming them over hot coals. This wasn't just survival, it was culinary creativity, like a prehistoric version of a campfire cookout. In Ethiopia, early humans traded obsidian tools across hundreds of kilometers, a network of exchange that mirrors Neanderthal trade routes for fossil shells in Europe. These shells, found far from their coastal origins, suggest Neanderthals valued beauty and history, collecting relics from a world long gone even to them. My analysis dives deeper. We often frame Neanderthals as a failed branch of humanity because they vanished, but that's a modern bias. For 200,000 years, they adapted to climates we'd find brutal, from icy tundra to Mediterranean scrublands. They built windbreaks from brush, as seen in phytoliths, tiny silica stones and plant tissue found at their campsites. They organized their spaces with areas for tool making, food processing, and sleeping on straw bedding. This wasn't chaos, it was community. Their survival wasn't about brute strength, but cooperation and ingenuity. Compare that to early modern humans in Africa who were stockpiling grains and crafting beads from ostrich eggshells. Both groups were solving the same problems, how to live, connect, and create in a world that didn't make it easy. Here's a vivid image. A Neanderthal woman, let's call her Sura, kneels by a stream grinding cattail roots into a paste. Her hands are calloused, her brow ridge prominent, but her focus is sharp. Nearby, her group repairs a windbreak, weaving branches to shield their fire from the wind. Across the continent, an early human in Africa is doing something similar, shaping a spear point from obsidian traded from a distant volcano. These parallel lives, separated by thousands of miles, show a shared drive to innovate. My commentary? We've been too quick to draw lines between us and them. Neanderthals weren't a sideshow. They were part of the main act, co-evolving with early humans in a global experiment to become who we are today. What can a people who vanished 30,000 years ago teach us in 2025? Plenty. Neanderthals weren't just survivors. They were builders of culture, caregivers, and creators. Their story, etched in bones, stones, and now DNA, is a mirror reflecting our own humanity. They crafted jewelry from eagle feathers and seashells, not for survival, but for meaning, much like we wear symbols of identity today. They cared for their injured, like the man from Shanidar Cave in Iraq, who lived years with an amputated arm, his group adapting to support him. This wasn't just charity, it was community, a recognition that every member mattered, whether they could hunt or not. Let's make this tangible. Imagine a Neanderthal elder, call him Tor, sitting by a fire in Gorham's cave. His joints ache from decades of tracking game, but he's teaching a child to nap flint, passing on knowledge that will keep the group alive. Fast forward to today, Think of a grandparent teaching a kid to cook a family recipe, or a teacher mentoring a student through a tough subject. That's the same thread. Knowledge shared across generations, binding us together. Or consider a modern example. In 2020, a community in rural Alaska rallied to support a disabled veteran, adapting tools so he could fish again. That's Neanderthal-level care, 
rooted in the same instinct to value every life. My insight here is that Neanderthals challenge our obsession with progress. We measure success by skyscrapers and smartphones, but they measured it by survival and connection. Their 3% DNA in us, carrying genes for immunity, hair color, maybe even brain function, reminds us we're not so different. They faced a world of ice and predators, yet they created art, cooked complex meals, and traded across continents. Their extinction wasn't failure, it was a transition, their legacy woven into our genes and our story. If they could thrive in a world that harsh, what's stopping us from facing our own challenges with the same grit? The lesson? Humanity isn't about being the fastest or the strongest. It's about creating, connecting, and enduring. When you feel overwhelmed, think of Sura grinding cattails or Tor teaching by the fire. They didn't give up, even when the odds were brutal. Their DNA in you is a quiet nudge. You're built to adapt, to care, to keep going. So, whether it's a personal struggle or a global crisis, channel that prehistoric resilience. Build something, help someone, share a story. That's what makes us human, then and now. If this journey into the prehistoric world hooked you, check out online courses like the one on Coursera about human evolution. It's free and packed with insights. Hit that like button, subscribe, and let me know in the comments. What's one thing you'd ask a Neanderthal if you could meet them? Thanks for watching, and let's keep uncovering the past together.